If you were walking down the street and you saw a penny just sitting there, let's say it's a nice penny, like a 2023 just came out of the vault or whatever penny. You saw it lying on the ground. Raise your hand if you would pick it up. I'm a little questionable. I don't know. <laughs> it depends. I don't know. It's how I'm feeling. My daughter would probably pick it up. It's like gold, right, for, for a four-year-old. Um, but for me, I look at a penny, and I'm like, that's ah, just going to go at the Tupperware on top of my fridge for six years. You know? <laughs> okay, so that's interesting. Uh, what about a quarter? Raise your hand if you pick up a quarter. Okay, there's a bit of a shift. A, a quarter is where it starts to become better for me. <laughs> I remember as a kid, like, a quarter sitting in the palm of my hand, and that was big. Like, I don't know, quarters have shrunk over the years, I know, I've noticed that, because it used to fill up my whole hand, and I just would hold that, like, this is like a doubloon, this is like pirate treasure, this is, yeah, a shilling, this is, <laughs> this is like gold, oh, yeah, so I, this was like a treasure when I was a little kid. Okay, so most of you said a quarter, but not all of you, I noticed. So how, am I, how many of you would go for a dollar? How many of you would, would go, go bend out on the street and pick up a dollar? Less of you? I think you're just getting tired of raising your hands. How many of you would go for a dollar? Because I know some of you don't value quarters more than a dollar. <laughs> yeah, it's a dollar. It's a whole dollar. Of course, if you saw this lying on the road, you'd say, oh, okay. Yeah, there's nobody around, by the way. This isn't a moral thing. Like, you're not, you're not, you don't, like, have to go turn this into the police, okay? I'm just saying if you found a dollar. Should I say it's in the middle of the woods? Okay, it's in the middle of the woods. No one's around. Yeah, most of us would pick up the dollar, right? Um, it's, it's valuable. The dollar is valuable. You can buy a whole pop with this. Not at McDonald's anymore. It's $1. thirty-nine now, but I won't complain. Um... Yeah, it's valuable. You could buy a pop, you could buy a, a thing of chips, you could buy whatever you want with it. You can add to your hoard, your dragon hoard of money, just this one dollar. It's great. But my question to you is, to many of you, not all of you, some of you were like, yes, I'd pick up that penny. But to most of you, I'd say, said, no, I wouldn't go for the penny, and I probably wouldn't go for the penny. Why not? The penny has value. The penny has worth. Um, when I looked it up online, the penny is worth approximately 1.0 cents. So there you go. 1.0 cents. It has value. So why wouldn't we pick it up? <laughs> yeah. The reason, the, yes, that too. The reason that most of us wouldn't pick it up is because it's an issue of comparative value. Compared to what we have, you know, some of us have hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars in the bank. I don't want to think about having hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank, because that just makes me feel sad. But some of us, have, we have, compared to what we have stored away, compared to what we own, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, a penny is not worth very much. In fact, if you think about it, a dollar sometimes feels like it's not really worth that much, right? When I bought a house... Last year, buying a house changes your value of money completely, completely. And I just want to be clear, the bank owns my house. But um, it's just like, well, if you spend hundreds of thousands on a house, it's like, what's a dollar? It's like, would a dollar make a, the difference between the sale of our house? Probably not. Compared to what it costs, it's like, what's a dollar? Yeah. So I've discovered this truth, and I believe it's true, so you can call me out on it if it's not, but I think it is. And it's this, it's when humans have a lot of one thing, the individuals lose their value. When humans have a lot of one thing, the individual loses its value. If you have a lot of money, a dollar doesn't become that valuable to you anymore. If you have a lot of water, like we do in the Pacific Northwest, you know, it literally falls from the sky, like a miracle, every day, except yesterday, which is beautiful. We look, we fill our glass with water from the sink, and we drink half of it because we're thirsty, and then we're like, you know, I'm, pretty, I'm not really thirsty anymore, there's still half in the glass. We're like, eh, dump it down the drain. It's not valuable to us. We have so much. Well, you know, think of someone in the desert, like, if they see you, they see a picture of you dumping that in the sink, they're like, oh my goodness, that's so valuable to me. What about food? We have so much food here. We have so much food in America. And yet, when I see that slightly overripe banana in the fruit bowl on top of my microwave, I hold it in my hand and I say, 
there are some brown spots on that. <laughs> it's going to be all chalky and kind of yucky. And I like put it in the garbage. I don't really do that, but you know what I mean. Like, I'll probably give it to my kid. You know? <laughs> but I don't want it. I don't want it. I want, I, want, I want a better banana. I don't want the one with the brown spots on it, right? You guys are acting so much better than me. You do the same thing. <laughs> I don't want that slightly overripe banana. It's because when I have so much food, that banana seems like, eh, it's like banana's like the cheapest fruit. Just like, toss it, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Ugh, so I'll repeat myself. When humans have a lot of one thing, the individuals lose their value to humans. But not so with God. With God, this is not the case. Did you know that in the history of the world, all of human history, there have been 117 billion Christians? 117 billion Christians. Now, to put that in perspective, there are only 8 billion people on the earth right now. Christians, Muslims, atheists, etc., so there have been a lot of people who have been saved by grace through Jesus Christ. A lot. A huge number of souls. People who are signed, sealed, delivered. I'm God's. Saved by the Holy Spirit. They're going to heaven. We're going to meet them in heaven. And yet, though God has so many, the value of a single soul has never once diminished in God's sight. He doesn't look at us like a dollar and say, that's not super valuable. I have so many. I have so many. He doesn't look at us like a penny. I have so many. I don't really need that dollar. I don't really need that penny. He looks at you and says, you are valuable. You are precious. You are worthy of my love. I love you. You are valuable. You are as, valu as valuable to him now as Adam was in the beginning, the first man, one-to-one -one ratio, one God, one man, he loved Adam. Now we fast forward thousands of years, one God, billions upon billions of us, same love. You are valued, you are loved. Now with that in mind, let's turn to our passage. Luke chapter 15, verse 1. This is the story, the parable of the lost sheep. Luke chapter 15, verse 1. It says this, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners, much like Zacchaeus, who Pastor Garen preached about last week, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. He drew them in. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, with such dirty, filthy, gross people, so far from God. He was even eating with them. And so, in response to the Pharisees' behavior, Jesus told them this story. He said, If a man has 100 sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Will he not leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and his neighbors saying, rejoice with me, celebrate with me, let's have a party because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have never strayed away. More joy in heaven. Do you see the value that God places on a single soul? It is huge. It is immense. It is immeasurable. He loves you. The lost are precious to him. The lost are priceless to him. The lost are valuable. Valuable. Why? 
Is it because of what, they, of what they've done? Because they're far from God. They're living in sin. They're sinners. I loved how Stephen brought in Romans 5. Good choice <laughs> for this. While we were still sinners, God loved us and sent his son for us. It wasn't because of what we did. It was because we were his. It was because we were his creation, because he cared for us, because he loved us so much that he sent his son to live among us and die for us and be raised again on the third day. It's because you were his. And we see that in the passage. 15 verse 4. It says, if a man has 99 sheep and he gets a new one, no. It's if a man has 100 sheep, the, the, the saved and the sinners alike, God counts them all as his. They are his creation. They were pulled up out of the dirt. He breathed life into every single one of us, saved and unsaved alike. We are all his. Since the beginning of time, God has not viewed humanity as something to be gained. Like, I'm just going to get some new people. No, he views us as, as people who were lost. We were lost. We wandered away from him. We left the sheepfold. We wandered away into the wilderness, and he wants to bring us back. We were created for relationship with God. We were created to be his family, created to be his friends. He wanted to have this joyful, wonderful life with us, but every single one of us has strayed away from the fold at one time or another. So he wants to bring you back. You are his precious possession, and that is why it hurts him so much when we stray away. It's the loss of a family member. It's the loss of a friend. My, um, what about a month or two ago, I lost my grandfather. He was 91 years old, and just really quickly he started going downhill, and now he's with Jesus. He was a Christian. He was saved. Praise the Lord. He was more saved than all of us. Let's, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I still felt lost. Because he was my family. He was my mentor. He spoke life into me throughout my entire life. He showed me what it means to be a pastor and to care for people. And so though I know he is with Jesus, because I love him, because he is precious to me, I felt lost. And he was saved. So imagine, maybe I know some of you can, now imagine the pain of losing someone who was not saved. Losing someone who was lost, who was far from God. My other grandfather on the other side, he is an avid atheist. He has wandered from God and he has stayed away from God in anger for 90 years. He doesn't have that much time left. And we've spoken to him. We've, we've tried to pray with him. We've tried to reason with him, try to share God's love with him, and he will not come. And so even though he is not gone, and we are praying that we'll have a, a bedside hospital conversion on his deathbed, but in this moment we mourn for him. Because if something does not change, he will be lost forever. That is how God sees the unsaved. If they continue on their current course, far from God, lost, wandered away, far away from him, they will be lost forever. Do you understand? Do you see the Father's heart in this? And you look at the Pharisees, they're like, why are you eating with these people? And God's like, are you kidding me? These people are valuable. These, I mourn their loss. I mourn their life in sin. I want them back. So of course I'm going to go get them. Of course. We see this, excuse me, 
We see this talked about in Matthew 18, verse 14. It says, in the same way, it is, this is, so the interesting thing about this passage is this is the same account. This is the same story, the same parable of the lost sheep. But after it, Jesus adds something in this passage that's just a little bit different. He says, in the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. It is not his will. It is not what he wants. It is not in his design. Remember, God designed every one of you to be in eternal relationship with him and with each other. It's not his will. So when the, those Pharisees ask him, why are you associating with those filthy sinners like this? They're basically asking him, you know, we talked about the dollars before. Why are you reaching out? Why are you bending down to pick out this filthy, dirty, disgusting dollar? A dollar that's caked in mud. A dollar that's caked in sewage. They view it as dirty, filthy, unclean, not worthy of being touched. But God looks at that dollar. God looks at you and says, though that dirt dollar is dirty, it still has value. It is still as valuable today as the day it was printed in the United States government from the treasury. It's still just as valuable. It just needs to be cleaned up a little bit. Jesus says you are his. He loves you. He says you need him. You need him. And so, because the lost are precious to him, because the lost are so valuable to God, the lost are pursued by him to the ends of the earth. Verse 4, read that again. A man has a hundred sheep, one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the ninety-nine others? Leaves them behind. In the wilderness, and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it. He leaves the 99. He leaves those, are sa those who are saved and prioritizes the pursuit of the lost. Prioritizes the pursuit of the lost because they're in danger. Like the idea of a sheep wandering through the wilderness is not just he's like alone. There are lions. There are snakes. There are chasms and cliffs that they can fall in. In the same way, those who are lost are in danger of the fires of hell. And so he leaves the 99 behind and goes after the one. Jesus left the crowd of believers and sat down with the, with the, the tax collectors and the sinners because they needed him. He sought them out. He says, I will do everything in my power to save them from hell, even if it means temporarily prioritizing them, the lost over the found. And there's no greater illustration for this than what Pastor talked about last week with Zacchaeus. What a story, people. What a story. I'll just do a quick blazing recap for you. Jesus is walking through the city and he's surrounded by people. He's surrounded by believers, people who are listening to what he's saying, people who are following him, people who want more of him. These are the Christians. These are the believers. And Zacchaeus is just trying to see Jesus. He sees Jesus coming. He can't see beyond the crowd. Jesus is engrossed in the middle of the 99 people. He's in the middle of all the believers, and Zacchaeus can't get through. And so he climbs a fig tree and tries to just get a glimpse of Jesus. And Jesus turns his head, looks at Zacchaeus in that tree, and says, Zacchaeus, you come down right now, for I'm going to be a guest at your house today. I'm going to throw aside all conventions, all ideas that I should keep myself clean from you, all ideas that, that you're not good enough for me, that you are filthy, that you are dirty, that, I, that you are unclean. I'm going to leave the 99, and I'm going to be a guest at your house, Zacchaeus. He leaves the 99, 
and he pursues the one. And you know the end of the story. Zacchaeus' life was forever changed. He turned it around. He said, oh, half of my money I'm giving to the poor. If I've ever cheated anyone, I'm giving them back four times as much. And this is Jesus' response. Luke 19, verse 9. Jesus says, salvation has come to this home today. I have brought a lost sheep back into my flock. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Seek and save. He goes and he brings them back. Amen? He reaches down and picks up that dirty dollar. He says, this still has value. This can be cleaned. This can be saved. This can be used. This is, this has used. This is, this is, this is useful. This has a place in my kingdom, you know? Valuable. And the others that he temporarily left, they're fine. Jesus has not abandoned them to the wilderness. They are fine. They are safe. They are secure. They are like dollar bills. So if a sinner is a dirty dollar picked up off the ground, you, the 99, because remember, if this story, like if we're going to extrapolate this story to you guys, all of you saved people, you're the 99 that got left. And that's good. That's great. Because the lost are more important right now. Getting the lost are more important. I'm not saying you're unimportant. What you are, you are a crisp $1 bill, safe and secure inside of a bank vault. Now, I looked up for a picture of a bank vault full of money, and literally, this is the only thing that comes up. I don't know, this isn't safe practices. Like, I don't know why the money is spilling out like this. You're more safe than this. <laughs> You Google money in a bank, I, I, I imagine like stacks of neatly stacked like money, that's impossible to find. I couldn't do it. I didn't have enough time to shop it for you, so here you go. This is what you get. You're not pouring out of, God, of heaven. You're not pouring out of God's, God's house. You're safely tucked inside, so just imagine that. That's as good as I could do for you with the time I had. <laughs> uh, you are safe. You are secure. I love how it says... In John chapter 10, verse 27, um, this is not on the screen, but I'll just read it to you. Jesus has another, he loves these sheep illustrations. And he says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. You are not in danger in the wilderness. Jesus may have left you behind in the wilderness to temporarily go after the one, but you're safe. You're fine. No one can snatch you away from God. You can only wander away. The devil can't grab you and yank you, yank you out. It's on you. So just rest in that security. Rest in that bank vault. You're not going to spill out, despite what the picture implies. The 99 are fine. Yeah. No one can steal them. No one can snatch them. Because Jesus will return. And you will have an eternity to be with him. Eternity. Can you fat talk about comparative value? Let's, uh, should I get into this? Sure, why not? The I got time. <laughs> Talked about comparative value, like this dollar compared to the hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of dollars. You know, Bill Gates has a net worth of $105 billion. This dollar is like worthless to him. He, he even said at $100, he'd start to pick it up. Um, and I also learned that the comparative value of a quarter to Bill Gates, so us reaching down and picking up a quarter, for him to have that same experience as us, he would have to reach down and pick up $45,000. <laughs> Isn't this not mind-blowing? Anyway, let's talk about the comparative value of time. You've got 100 years on this earth, 120 if you're really lucky and God really blesses you. 
Do you know how big eternity is? Right, no one does. It's, it's, it's impossible. It's infinite. It goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. But your life is so valuable because of the people you can save in it. This is your one chance. This is your one opportunity to reach out and save those who are lost. You have 100 years to do it. 100 years. So make use of it. It is valuable. It is essential. It's good to be the 99. And it's really good to be the one. It's really good to be the one who's coming home. The one who's found. Amen? Amen. All right. Final point. 15 verse 5, going back to that same story. Jesus says, and when the man who lost the sheep has found it, he found his lost lamb, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. He picked up that dollar, he put it right in his pocket. You're his. In the same way, There is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have never strayed away. When Jesus finds that lost sheep, when you return to his fold, when you come back into his arms, he throws a party. He celebrates. All heaven celebrates. And you understand what this feels like if you have had someone in your life who was lost. And then they were found. They were headed toward hell, headed toward destruction, but Jesus brought them back and you said, praise the Lord, because now I can spend eternity with them. 117 billion people saved, plus one. Praise the Lord. Praise God. What was lost has been found. The relationship that God intended from the beginning has been restored. Because remember, he's not gaining a new sheep. He is restoring what was lost. It's not a gaining, it is a regaining. Capturing you back. Bringing you back into the fold. And that's reason to celebrate. Amen? Amen. We, um, I have a video to show you guys. And it's really awesome. Leon, you might want to run. I'm just kidding. Please stay. (laughs) Um, And it just illustrates this point so well. So I just want want to show this to you. I want to show this. My name is Leon Charbonneau. I used to work at the Boeing Company. And one day, my boss brought a guy to work with me. And I said, I didn't need anybody. And he said, you get him, he's a troublemaker. He was a troublemaker because he read his Bible. And he asked me if I believed in Jesus Christ. I said, yes, with my fingers crossed. (laughs) And so he's asked, he told me, he said, if I find a good Bible believing church, would you go to it? And of course, to appease him, I said, yes. But then I went. And from that time on, I've been planted in a church, and I am very grateful to Christ for his salvation. Amen. I got planted in the house of the Lord, and now I'm thriving. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> amen, amen. How's that feel, Leon? You okay? <laughs> we love you, man. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I only borrowed these, so you might have to, I'll pay you back later for that. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I have a question for you guys. How did Jesus, seeing Leon's value, seeing that Leon was precious to him, how did he reach out? How did he pursue Leon? Through someone else, through the Boeing employee. Through the troublemaker, God got him, God tracked him down and brought him back into the fold. 
You see, when Jesus spent his time on earth, he was his own hands and feet. He went forward and he pursued the tax collectors. He pursued the sinners and brought them back into the fold. But now that Jesus is in heaven, we do his work. You want to say something? Yeah. Really? Let me, can we get that on the mic so the people online can hear? We want to come up here, Leon? The day that I was saved and believed, within a week, he was gone. They transferred him to a different area, and one day I was walking out to go to my car, and there he was. And he was, I really believe that God put him there for a reason, for yeah. my salvation. I really mean that. Well, I don't know how I'll recover from that one. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, Leon, thank you for sharing that. Jesus placed this Boeing employee, he forced him in Leon's path because he was willing. He brought his Bible to work every day and read it at lunch every day. So his, employee, so his manager said, this guy's a troublemaker. So I'm going to give him to Leon. Probably because Leon knows how to deal with troublemakers, because if you know Leon, he's a bit of a troublemaker himself. <laughs> so he put this Boeing employee right in his path for just long enough to save him, because he was ready, he was willing to reach out and grab what was so valuable, what was so precious to God, who is now our brother. Amen? Amen. Let's give that Boeing employee a hand. <laughs> Amen. The lost are precious to God, and so they are pursued by God through you, through us. We recognize they are precious now, and we pursue them with all diligence through all prayer. Amen? Amen. So my challenge for you as you go about your week this week, is why don't, you all, why don't you all stand to your feet? Stand to your feet. I want you all to close your eyes and I want you to imagine someone who is in your life who is not saved. It could be a friend, family member, coworker, classmate. Imagine just one face. Just one. It's Mark. It's Susan. It's John. It's Grace. It's Corey. It's Alec. It's David. It's Rachel. Now understand, holding that image in your brain, that person is precious. And that person is valuable to God. So repeat after me. Say, they are precious. They are, precious. They are, valuable. They are valuable. So I will pursue them. And now you're trapped. There's no escape. That person that God placed in your heart, that placed in your mind, it is your assignment this week reach out to them. Be the hands and feet of Jesus. It is not an accident that that image came to your mind, that that person came to your mind at that moment. It is because God loves them and he sees they are valuable and he sees that he has perfectly positioned you in their life for a time such as this. And who knows, maybe your time with them isn't that long. Maybe like that Boeing employee, you're, you're, on the, you're on the docket to be transferred out soon. So get it done. Invite them to church. Share your testimony with them. Ask them that question, do you know Jesus Christ? What a question. 
Just out of nowhere. He didn't have, I bet he didn't even have any lead up to that. He was just like, hey, do you know Jesus? What a question. Sometimes that's all you have to say. Start that, that process of bringing them back to the fold because knowing they are so precious, so valuable, they are so loved, they are worthy of salvation, they are valuable. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus, give us eyes to see the value in every single person saved and unsaved alike, that you gave your life for us. You gave your life for them. And so we give our lives for them too. We give away, we cast off our comfort. We cast off our, um, our inhibitions, our, our desire to not stand out. We put that aside, Jesus. And we say, use us. Use us to be your hands and feet to reach out and invite more people. And, and share the gospel with them. In Jesus' name, give us courage, God, to stand even when it's hard, to read our Bible even when we'll be called a troublemaker, even if we might lose our job. In Jesus' name, amen. And maybe you're lost right now. Maybe after hearing this message, you recognize, I am far away from God. Though I was his at the beginning, I have wandered away, and I'm living my life in sin. I'm living my life far away from him, and I want to come back. Now is your chance. Now is your chance. You turn from your sins, and you turn to Jesus. Become one of his sheep. Become a follower of Jesus. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior. And then you let him lead your life. How many of you, every head bowed, every eye closed? How many of you want to be saved today? How many of you want to be returned? Raise your hand. I see that hand. I see that one and that one and that one. Yes, that one, that one. And if you're online hearing this message, God sees your hand too. Don't be afraid to raise it. He sees it. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. All right, we're going to join together. And all of us are going to pray. Who are Christians? We're going to join with you. But if you are praying this for the first time to Jesus, or you are just returning back to him, pray it to God, not to me. Or just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, Jesus. I'm, a I'm a sinner. I turn from my sins. I from my and I turn, I turn to you. Be my Savior. Be my, Savior. Be my Lord. Save me, Jesus, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And I'll tell you what, if you prayed that prayer today, for the first time, you are back in the arms of Jesus. What was lost has been found. What was gone has been restored. And you can have deep, lasting relationship with him. Amen? For eternity. Imagine an eternity of heaven walking and talking with Jesus and singing. And I think there will be video games. I'm not sure. There's going to be probably sports. I don't know. There's going to be so much fun things in heaven. You're going to get to do all that with Jesus. And you're also a part of our family too. So I invite you, if today was your day, if what was lost has been found, please see Larry Warford at the Following Jesus booth in the, in the back. I didn't ask him before this, but now he's going to go. <laughs> he will stand by the... So the following, please take the Following Jesus course. It's a free course. Our church buys a book for you. Our church made, buys the course for you. And you go through. These are the steps to follow Jesus, to get to know him and talk to us. Reach out to us and we will reach out to you too. And let's walk alongside. Let's walk, let's walk together as we follow Jesus together. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Come on, can we thank Pastor Christian for that really encouraging word? Thank you. What a great day, huh? Man, so thankful that you guys were here this morning.
Uh, like Pastor Christian said, we have a lot of great resources for you. They're free. Uh, so please visit Larry at the table in the lobby. We'll give you a free book and access to free courses. There's also free, um, what is it, life journals uh, in the lobby. Uh, it's just got a Bible reading plan, has places for you to journal as you're praying, feel like the Lord is uh, talking to you. Um, we have a lot of ways that we just want to come come around you, support you. And uh, one of those things, too, that's the next step. If you gave your life to Jesus today, we're so proud of you. And the next step is baptism. Uh, according to Jesus, he said, the Great Commission, go make disciples and baptize them. And so if you want to know more about that, if you've never been baptized but you follow Jesus, we have a class. It's really quick. It'll be in the lobby. Uh, you'll see one of the classrooms by the bathroom has a baptism sign on it. We'd love for you to stick around for that. Uh, it's, it's been a great day. Hope you guys have a great week. We love you. We bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.